Hey, good morning, everybody. Good to be with you. We're going to do some singing to the Lord, praising Him for who He is and what He's done. Hope you'll join with us uh, as we just prepare ourselves to hear from the Lord and to offer up praise from our hearts and our lips to Him. I was made. I 
was made to be loved by you, to be loved by you, to be loved by you, Jesus. I was made to be loved by you, to be loved by you, to be loved by you, Jesus.
than my Savior's done for me. Oh, give him your praise, worship his name, all that I am, sing hallelujah. Forever I'm free, forever I'm free, forever I'm changed. Forever my life defined by his grace. The Wagners are watching from home. Ah. Miss you. Love you. Get well soon. An embassy is the primary diplomatic mission in a foreign country's capital. A consulate is a smaller mission in a major city, still considered the property of the uh, uh, country that it represents. Israel on Monday struck an Iranian consulate in Damascus, Syria, and killed a number of senior leaders of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard. An attack on that embassy or uh, consulate, as I said, it's, it's an attack on the country itself. And so Israel and the U.S. are both saying that Iran is about to retaliate. Military strategists say it was intended by Israel to draw Iran into the fight which would also perhaps draw the United States into the fight, which would accelerate war in the Middle East. So we're all excited about that, I'm sure. It's a 
terrible what's going on over there and up in Ukraine, uh, wars and rumors of wars, as Jesus said. Meanwhile, people are talking about a uh, red heifer in uh, Israel, and they think, well, that's, you know, that's low on the totem pole of things that are important, but actually it's not. Uh, first of all, a red heifer, it's needed for a special sacrifice after which its ashes are used to ritually clean the implements that the Jews use in ritual sacrifice. Finding a red heifer that meets certain strict biblical standards is super rare. The Mishnah, which is an authoritative written embodiment of Jewish oral traditions, teaches that only nine red heifers have been sacrificed from the time of the wilderness tabernacle until the second temple was destroyed in A.D. 70. And so that's not very many of these little animals. The Jewish scholar Maimonides in about 1200 uh, A.D. believed that the tenth red heifer would only be found and sacrificed when the Messiah would come. And so there's all this buzz among some Orthodox groups that, uh, that this is the time that their Messiah is going to uh, appear. Now, this background helps you understand why a spokesman from Hamas a couple of months ago said that one of the motivations for them to attack Israel at this time is the red heifer that is in country. Uh, we think that's you know, kind of weird, but they understand that when Israel gets this red heifer, they are completely ready to uh, rebuild their temple uh, and wanting to, and probably are going to, you know, maybe blow up the Dome of the Rock or something like that so that they can rebuild their temple. And so this is a preemptive strike by Hamas uh, because of these religious, what we would call religious issues. And we, we really don't understand that in the West. Probably when I said, you know, World War III is going to start and you're talking about a red heifer. I mean, get your priorities straight, Pastor. I mean, come on, you know. But this is very, but he said, I mean, I, I, about four or five weeks ago, I read you the article from uh, the Hamas guy. He says, yeah, this is a major, major reason why we attacked. Now, beyond that, the Jews now believe they've also found a Kohen who qualifies to lead that ceremony. Kohen is the Hebrew word for priest, and it is specifically used in reference to the descendants of Aaron, the Aaronic priesthood. The Temple Institute released a photograph on Twitter with the caption, a Kohen fit to perform the red heifer ceremony. And they said of this man, the young Kohen in the photo visiting the red heifer candidates in Shiloh is fit to perform the red heifer ceremony. He came into the world via home birth, has never set foot in a hospital or cemetery, and therefore is considered by Jewish law to be the highest level of purity, having never contracted impurity imparted by contact with a corpse. So I don't know if they put an ad in the Jerusalem Times or how they found this of it. Can you imagine that? We're looking for someone who was born at home, has never been in a hospital for any reason, never been to a cemetery, which in our family, they would have visited tons of cemeteries by now. Um, and, and they've uh, never come in contact with a corpse. And you think, oh, hey, I could do that. Sounds like, what are you going to be? I, I'm a Kohen. I'm going to be the next priest. Anyway, but this is all serious stuff. Th this is happening and uh, pushing these events forward. This is all exactly what you'd expect from reading the Bible's unfulfilled prophecies. Uh, we are futurists. That means we believe that the three or four or 500 uh, end times prophecies that have yet to be fulfilled will be fulfilled in literal uh, sense. Uh, they're not allegorical. They're not spiritual. It's going to happen. There will be a temple rebuilt for the Great Tribulation. Uh, they will have animal sacrifice. Israel will be despised by the rest of the world. All the nations will be against her. All of this, you read the Bible and say, hey, this is kind of happening right now on a lot of different fronts. End times events, they're going to progress according to God's plan. The seven-year time of great tribulation is going to break out upon the earth. You can read about it in chapters 6 through 19 of the Revelation. What you won't read about there is the church. We are significantly absent as God's wrath is poured out upon those who reject Christ on the earth. Jesus promised his church in Revelation, he said, I will keep you from, he meant out of, the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. He keeps us out of those seven years by raising deceased church 
saints, and rapturing we who are alive and remain. And that return of the Lord in the clouds to re resurrect the dead and rapture his church could happen at any moment. It's considered imminent. Nothing needs to happen before the Lord can do that. And so we ask you each week, are you ready for the rapture? If not, get ready and stay ready and keep looking up because ready or not, Jesus is coming. Let's listen to the announcements together. Good morning, everyone. It is great to be with you at church today. Here's what's going on and coming up, starting with our schedule this week. On Monday nights, we have a youth group from 6.30 to 8.30. It's for ages 12 to 18. The youth hang out, play games, eat snacks, study the Bible, worship together, get their questions answered. Bring them out tomorrow night at 6.30. On Wednesday morning, we have a men's group. It starts at 6.30, ends at about 7.15. Guys start arriving as early as 6.00. Come on out, fellows. Get a free cup of coffee with laughs, prayer, and Bible study. Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, we have a midweek service. At midweek, we love to study the Bible, share scripture, take communion together, worship with the kids. Come on out. You'll be glad you did. We could use a few more volunteers in the cafe on Sunday mornings. Cafe is a great place to meet new people and serve your church family. It may seem intimidating, but we try to make it as easy as possible. If you can work a microwave, you can do the cafe. If you're interested, email us today at cafe at calvaryhamper.com or grab an orange I want to serve card off the foyer table and fill it out and drop it in one of the offering boxes. Quick reminder that you can find us on YouTube. Our channel there has a growing archive of videos, but we also live stream our services and have some special other videos like shorts and Q&A videos there. You can find it at youtube.com slash Calvary Hanford. We hope that's a blessing to your feed. And in case you didn't know, you can listen to recordings of our live worship from Sunday mornings or Wednesday nights in our mobile app or on SoundCloud. We'd love for you to check it out, especially if you don't make it a habit of coming out on Wednesday nights. You might not know that you're missing out on guest musicians and our next generation of worship leaders here at the church. Find it all in our mobile app or at soundcloud.com slash Calvary Hamford. Well, those are your announcements. There's always a lot going on here at Calvary. Get connected and stay connected with what God is doing here at your church. Chapter 54. Rejoice, childless one, who did not give birth. Burst into song and shout, you who have not been in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the sight of your tent and let your tent curtains be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your ropes and drive your pegs deep. For you will spread out to the right and to the left, and your descendants will dispossess nations and inhabit the desolate cities. Do not be afraid, for you will not be put to shame. Don't be humiliated, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth, and you will no longer remember the disgrace of your widowhood. Indeed, your husband is your maker. His name is the Lord of armies, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of the whole earth. For the Lord has called you like a wife deserted and wounded in spirit, a wife of one's youth when she is rejected, says your God. I deserted you for a brief moment, but I will take you back with abundant compassion. In a surge of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment, but I will have compassion on you with everlasting love, says the Lord, your Redeemer. For this is like the days of Noah to me, when I swore that the water of Noah would never flood the earth again. So I have sworn that I will not be angry with you or rebuke you. Though the mountains move and the hills shake, my love will not be removed from you, and my covenant of peace will not be shaken says your compassionate Lord. Poor Jerusalem, storm-tossed and not comforted. I will set your stones in black mortar and lay your foundations in lapis lazuli. I will make your fortifications out of rubies, your gates out of sparkling stones, and all your walls out of precious stones. Then all your children will be taught by the Lord. Their prosperity will be great you will be established on a foundation of righteousness. You will be far from oppression, 
you will certainly not be afraid. You will be far from terror. It will certainly not come near you. If anyone attacks you, it is not from me. Whoever attacks you will fall before you. Look, I have created the craftsman who blows on the charcoal fire and produces a weapon suitable for its task. And I have created the destroyer to cause havoc. No weapon formed against you will succeed. And you will refute any accusation raised against you in court. This is the heritage of the Lord's servants, and their vindication is from me. This is the Lord's declaration. Ooh, that's bright. Hello, balcony. Just miss you guys. I'd sit in the balcony if I if I didn't have just you know ten minutes of work during the week. I would I'd sit in the balcony. But anyway, we are in Isaiah fifty four. I hope your Bible or your device is open there so you can follow along, not just so that you can, uh, you know, make sure that I'm on track, but the Lord wants to speak to you through the Scripture personally and reveal Himself to you and show you things, and in order for that to happen, you have to have the Scripture open, you have to be reading it. We recommend um, repetitive reading here, uh, and what that means is you should, you know, take a section of Scripture and read it over and over and over again. Uh, and as you do, God will begin to show you things, you know, simple at first, maybe just repeated words, but that's how he begins to speak to you and show you what's in his word. And so uh, 54, 1 through 17 of Isaiah, the topic here this morning, the Lord tells the nation of Israel what he has in store for her as his wife. And the title of the message, I now announce us husband and wife. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, as we approach your word, we want to do it with a proper reverential humility. We want to know, Lord, that you are God and we are not. We want to put any selfishness aside, any self-righteousness, and be humble before you, be broken even before you, Lord, so that you can speak to us in a way that uh, will put us back together and move us along uh, becoming more mature and more like Jesus Christ. That's the goal, after all, Lord, for, for you to finish the work you've begun in us, that work of making us like yourself. And so, Lord, uh, this ancient text written to an audience that uh, we would not have been a part of, I pray that you would make it real in our hearing and in our lives. Uh, give us application, Lord. Give us knowledge. We pray it in Jesus' name. And those who agreed said, amen. Christians who held a conviction that it was wrong to go to a R-rated movie, were conflicted. How could they not join their brothers and sisters who rented out theaters and invite unbelievers to watch The Passion of the Christ? Remember that, 2004? It was a phenomena that blew through the church. It was the top-grossing rated R movie of all time. It's since slipped to number nine. It has a chance to move up on the list if it does well in its theater re-release this year, commemorating its 20th anniversary. Have you ever wondered why Christ's suffering is called his passion? The Latin word, passio, means suffering. Its first recorded use is in the early translations of the Bible that appeared in the second century to describe the death of Jesus. Its meaning remained exclusively Christological until the middle of the 11th century. Then its meaning and its usage began to change. It started being used of his followers to describe their persecution and martyrdom as well. By the 13th century, passion was being used to refer to any strong drive or emotion in anyone. William Shakespeare is believed to be the first to use it to describe a strong romantic or sexual desire. The Lord expressed a more Shakespearean passion in chapter 54 when he said, for your maker is your husband. I'll organize my comments around two points. Number one, in his passion, the Lord is always preserving you. Number two, in his passion, the Lord is always providing you. Let's take a look in verses one through nine at the Lord preserving us. Now, if I say Jesus preserves you, some would say, well, yeah, but only if you persevere. The doctrine of the perseverance of the saints 
is our attempt to understand, and I quote, whether or not a true believer who has experienced genuine regeneration can fall away from the faith and perish eternally. Our text in Isaiah is not an attempt to teach anything regarding the doctrine of perseverance. Uh, It's interesting to note, however, the emphasis here on the Lord preserving Israel. He says to them, with great mercies, I will gather you. With everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you. For their part, the Jews do everything they can to not persevere. They keep sinning. They keep rejecting the Lord. Uh, and, and yet the Lord says, well, I'm going to preserve you, and you're going to know me. Uh, and so the emphasis there is, is clear. But again, this isn't a passage that's teaching on that doctrine per se, but it comes up anytime you use words like persevere or preservation, it comes up in the minds of some Christians. In my opinion, and that's all that it is, Christians can overemphasize perseverance to the point that it becomes works where you feel that you have to do certain things in order to maintain salvation, otherwise the Lord will pull the rug out from under you. It's easy to fall into self-righteousness and to, uh, you know, to think that you're doing great because you're doing things. If you're going to overemphasize something, then you underemphasize something else. And the thing that Christians tend to underemphasize is the Lord's passionate preserving of the saints. And that's one reason we like to talk more about what Jesus has done and is doing for us and in us and through us than what we have to do for the Lord. And so hopefully there would be a balance over time. Balance is not a great word, but it it makes sense. But that you would be able to hear about the Lord and what he's done for you. Uh, You know, everybody laughs, you know, about they ask, you know, what, what are some things that are not in the Bible that people think are? And one of them is the Lord helps those who helps themselves, right? Everybody thinks that's in the Bible, but it's not. But the truth is a lot of Christians think, oh, the Lord saved me, now I need to save myself. And I have to keep doing or find new things. And I have to really, really work at this and be, you know, almost pharisaical about my obedience or else I'm going to lose or forfeit my salvation. It's a difficult issue, agreed. But... We're going to, if we're going to emphasize something, we're going to emphasize what Jesus did and the fact that he says that he will bring this to fruition, that he will complete what he's started in us, right? Uh, he's going to present us faultless before the Father. Uh, and so overemphasize that. Chapter 54, it's a future prophecy touching upon the great tribulation, the return of the king, the kingdom of God on earth, and eternity. The great tribulation that lasts seven years has many names. We prefer to call it the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, If you've been here for a lot of our Isaiah studies, you've heard me say that numerous times. I bring it up because we most commonly call it the great tribulation or the tribulation. And to just start calling it the time of Jacob's trouble sounds a little odd. So uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah called it that. and It's a better designation because... It is about Israel. It's trouble for Israel mostly so that God can bring her back to a knowledge of him. Uh, And so when we talk about these things, the great tribulation, the tribulation, time of Jacob's trouble, it's all the same period of time with different emphasis. One more clarification. Historically, the northern kingdom of Israel had already been destroyed and was dispersed. Isaiah was thus addressing the southern kingdom of Judah I'm going to use Israel in the general sense of God's future people, the all Israel that the Apostle Paul says will be saved in the future. All right, so verse 1, sing, O barren, you who have not born, break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. In the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, the Lord lists blessings upon Israel for her obedience And he lists what he calls curses upon them for their disobedience. Barren wombs are on the list of curses. And so if Israel was going through a time where they had took a census and they found out that very few women were having children, 
uh, of, then they would know that they were in a time when God was withdrawing his blessing from them. There were other signs as well, but this was a big one. Why would they sing and break forth into singing and cry aloud? Well, because desolate Israel would eventually be brought to salvation and fulfill all that God had promised her, which would be to have numerous children, too, much, uh, too many to number. God had promised Abraham, when he looked at the stars or he looked at the uh, seashore, he said, your descendants are going to be as the stars of the sky or as the sand on the seashore. And so though God may be disciplining them at the current time, in the future, he would keep his promises to them. Being temporarily desolate is better than being the married woman of this illustration. What does that mean? Well, for the purposes of illustration, this is referring to Gentile nations who prospered while Israel languished. And so while God was perhaps judging Israel using some of these Gentile nations, they would seem to be prospering, doing wonderfully, rich, increased with goods, families, children, and all that, while the Jews were oppressed and under discipline. But the Lord says that's all obviously going to change in the far future. Uh, and, and so you're always, you're always better off as a child of God, even if you're being disciplined, even if you don't have the things that the world has. Uh, those things are all passing away. We used to say years ago, they're all going to burn because that's what happens to this current creation. And then there's a new creation. Uh, and, and so don't, uh, don't lust after, don't desire material things. Uh, prefer the things that are spiritual, where your real wealth is and, and where your rich, richness, riches are. You can be rich in faith, uh, and, and that is a thing that can't be taken away from you. Verse 2, enlarge the place of your tent. Let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. Israel has never possessed all of the land God promised her. In the future, not only will she possess all of it, She'll need to annex more. And this is, I always picture Abraham uh, going around, you know, uh, he's the father of many nations and uh, many peoples, and they'd say, hey, uh, you know, what, uh, so what's the promise God made to you? Uh, my descendants are going to be as, you know, as many as the stars in the sky. He goes, well, how many children do you have? One. <laughs> and both my wife and I, when we had him, it was hard enough because we've been way past childbearing age. He, he's a miracle. Oh, so you got this one kid, yeah. Okay, God bless you. You're, you're crazy, man. Guy, that Abraham guy's nuts. Honey, stay away from Abraham. Uh, but, uh, and Sarah, she's always laughing. But anyway, uh, but you know, that's what God uh, did. Uh, he enlarged the place. And so it'd be like, it'd be like uh, maybe, you know, let's say Pam and I, you know, the kids are all out of the house. And we had, it'd be like us saying, hey, you know, we need to move now. And you get a realtor and say, oh, do you want to downsize? No, no, we want a 20-room mansion. We want a house so big that, you know, we, we can't deal with it. So I don't even know what's at the other end of it. And a whole other family could be living there, right? Well, why? Well, I don't know. Why not? You know, and so, but, uh, so that's the idea. You know, you, you want to be spiritual, not material. And uh, he says, hey, you guys are going to need a bigger tent. Uh, verse 3, for you shall expand to the right and to the left, and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. Has verse 3 happened no, this is future prophecy. It's going to happen. It will happen literally, but it hasn't happened yet. Verse 4, do not fear, for you will not be ashamed, neither be disgraced, for you will not be put to shame, for you will forget the shame of your youth and will not remember the reproach of your widowhood anymore. And so Israel could also be compared to an old widow in a reproachable widowhood, no worries, says the Lord. A renewed Israel is coming, and all such comparisons will be forgotten. Verse 5, your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, and your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. After the incident at the Tower of Babel, God was the maker of a new nation through Abraham and Sarah. He, he, sent, uh, he scattered the, the people, gave them languages, they went out and established nations, and he says, now I'm going to start over with a brand new nation, and I'm going to start it with Abraham and Sarah, and it's going to be the Hebrew people, it's going to be Israel. Eventually, uh, you know, Isaac would come along, and then eventually Jacob would come along, and then the 12 tribes, and you have what we have today. And so that's uh, the plan. 
And then the Messiah, the promised Savior from the Garden of Eden, he would come through that line, through that nation. Israel is presented as the wife of Jehovah here and elsewhere in the, uh, in the Scripture. It's an illustration, obviously. Let me ask you this. Is the New Testament church ever portrayed as fully married or as a wife? And the answer to that is no. We are always the betrothed yet unwed bride and Jesus our heavenly bridegroom. The Bible maintains a strict distinction between the nation of Israel, the physical descendants of uh, Abraham through Isaac and Jacob, and the church, age Christians, made up of Jews and Gentiles. Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum explains, any clear understanding of the scriptures requires that proper distinctions be maintained. One of these key biblical distinctions is the contrast between Israel and the church. For example, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but the nation of Israel is promised, the Jews, they are promised mostly physical blessings for their obedience and physical punishments for their disobedience, right? They're promised land, and it, it's a real land. They're in it right now, and all of these other things. The church, in the church age, we are uh, promised spiritual blessings in heavenly places, God hasn't given us a land. There, there's no land for us to find, right? Pilgrims didn't come here and find a new Israel in the United States. They found the, what was here in America, and it became the, you know, the United States. And so you understand what I'm saying? We are promised spiritual blessings, and so that's why you can't really say that Israel is the church in the Old Testament or that the church is Israel, because the blessings... Are, what blessings do I... If, I'm, if Israel is the church right? And you're thinking, who believes that? A lot of people do. If Israel is the church, what do I inherit? I, I want my land. I want to go to Israel and figure out what land is. I was talking to a guy on Twitter, I think it was this morning or yesterday, and he's doing this whole thing about, you know, the Israel is the church and the church is Israel. I said, okay, so what tribe are you from? He didn't think it was funny, but, you know... <laughs> But if you're Israel, right, if you say, well, no, we're Israel, okay, so what tribe are you from? There seem to be 12 tribes, though, and there really were 12 tribes, right? It wasn't just mystical. There were 12 tribes. There were 12, uh, you know, children born to Jacob, uh, whose name was changed to Israel. So you've got to keep this distinction. Now, the husband here, it says, is her redeemer. A redeemer had to be a close relative, and he had to have the means to redeem you. Since all humans are born in sin... No mere human has the means to redeem themselves or anyone else. Only by God taking on human flesh can these requirements be satisfied. And so we are slaves to sin. We're sold into the slavery of sin, let's say, as human beings. Uh, we don't have the means to redeem ourselves uh, because that would require a perfect sacrifice, and we can't make that. But the only person who could redeem us would be another human being who is like us and related to us, Angels couldn't do it. They're a whole different species. And so if what we read in the Garden of Eden is true, if the wages of sin is death, if Adam and Eve brought sin into the universe and all, the only possible Savior, the one promised in Genesis, is a God-man, is the God-man, is God in human flesh, who has uh, the, the, what it takes to redeem somebody, holiness, and also can relate to them because he was human. And so there's no other way for anyone to be saved. You know, people criticize Christianity and say, oh, you think you're the only way. We are, but not because we think we are. We are. There, no one else can redeem you except a perfect Savior a, who is also human, and there's no perfect humans except the one. And so Jesus Christ is our Redeemer. For the Lord has called you like a woman, forsaken and grieved in spirit, verse 6, like a youthful wife when you were refused, says your God. Israel was guilty of repeated, unrepented of sin, spiritual adultery. She worshiped idols and participated in abominable sex rituals uh, surrounding that. But God says, I'm going to restore you. My promises to you will be fulfilled. The Babylonian captivity cured Israel of idolatry once and for all. As a nation, however, to this very day, they remain in unbelief of the Messiah. Once again, Dr. Fruchtenbaum is helpful. He says, 
To this day, Israel is still in a period of punishment. The persecutions of the Jews around the world uh, prove this point. Now, there's no anti-Semitism in that. We are pro-Israel. We support her statehood, uh, her right to exist. And uh, as a nation, we should support uh, the fact that she owns all that land that was given to her by God. And so we should uh, avoid any two-state solution. And that's always what we propose, sadly, as the United States. And God says, anybody that wants to split up Israel, I don't like. And I, you know, I'm going to judge. And so we need to be careful. So we, we are pro-Israel in that sense, in terms of her statehood and all that. It doesn't mean we agree with everything that Israel always does or that we agree with them theologically, of course, because they're unbelievers, right? The nation of Israel, I mean, there's individual Jews who are saved, but as a nation, she is a Jewish nation, not a Christian nation, and they don't believe that Jesus Christ is Savior. They will. The Bible says they will see him whom they have pierced as he is returning to the earth at the end of the tribulation, and uh, they will be saved. All Israel will be saved. And so we're pro-Israel with those caveats. Verse 7, for a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. With little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. At any point, Israel could have repented, and when you repent, you find that God is right there. What then does I have forsaken you and hid my face from you really mean? Well, again, we're looking forward to the time of their trouble and the tribulation, That word little that modifies wrath could be translated and should be overflowing or outburst or surge of anger. He's looking ahead to the great tribulation for the outpouring of his wrath upon the whole earth that's going to bring Israel to salvation. The discipline will be so strong that Israel will be convinced for a time that God has totally forsaken them and turned away from them forever. This isn't at all talking about Jesus and his relationship with you or his church. He promised to never forsake you or hide from you. He said, I will never leave you or forsake you. It is on you to sort things out if you feel that way. You ever felt, uh, you know, that the Lord had turned his back on you or forsaken you? A lot of Christians do. That's, I mean this in the nicest way possible, that's your problem, (laughs) Because, yeah, I don't want to heap more problems on you, but uh, it really is because God said, you know what? I said I wouldn't. And so, you know, maybe you got to go all the way back to an apologetics class that proves that the Bible is God's word and that God has actually spoken to us because God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. I feel left by God. I feel forsaken. <laughs> he's, he's telling you that. And so the problem is, why? It's not God, it's you. And so why? His mercies are great, his kindness is everlasting. A lot of things in your Christian life do boil down to this, am I going to believe what God said? And if I don't, how am I going to get to the point where I do? Verse 9, for this is like the waters of Noah to me, for I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth. So I have sworn that I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you. The dialogue here is so casual. It's so intimate. God says, you know, all of this kind of reminds me of the flood. Have I told you about the flood lately? It's a great story. Outside, all around, tumult and terror. Can you imagine, the, the, you know, the waters of the deep break open and the you know, deluge from the... And I, can you hear people knocking through gopher wood? I mean, you got to know some people are saying, hey, I want on the ark, you know, and uh, looking at Home Depot for waterproof chainsaws or whatever and stuff. But I mean, it would have been horrible, awful. Inside the ark, Noah and company are kept safe through it. It's interesting, just prior to the telling of the flood story in chapter 6 of Genesis, something really fantastic occurs in chapter 5. In the closing verses of that chapter, we read, Enoch walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. Enoch was raptured before the flood. He was saved from out of the flood, while Noah and his family were saved going through the flood. And so for centuries, Christians have seen Enoch as a type of the church being raptured, 
prior to the judgment while Israel is kept safe through that so that all Israel can be saved at the end. Jesus has promised us we will not be on earth during the day of wrath. Now, back to what we started with. How, how do we persevere as Christians? Well, we abide in Christ. We talk to God through prayer. We engage with the word, participate in church life. We tell others about Jesus. I don't think it's legalistic to make a list like that. I mean, that's basic Christianity. And it's what, when I got saved uh, in 1979, it's what I wanted to do before I knew I wanted to do it. You know what I mean? I mean, I was all of a sudden, I want to talk to God, and I want to read the Bible, and I want to be with other Christians, and I, 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 I want to tell other people about the Lord, you know? So that's, that's just all normal. Nobody had to say, now, Gene, uh, the Lord saved you, but if you don't read 10 chapters a day, oh, man, you're, in a, you're going to hell in a handbasket. Uh, I mean, so, you know, and so it's, it's what you want to do anyway, and so just that's how you abide in Christ. Don't forget passion. You're the Lord's passion, and that means that he can be yours. The more you see him preserving you and, and you know, just doing things in your life, uh, the more you will want to persevere. Now, in his passion, the Lord is always providing you. That's these last few verses. Uh, this came to my mind. I don't know if it's funny or not, but uh, uh, everything's funny to me. I'm like Sarah. But anyway... <laughs> The Lord is going to feel the earth move under his feet. You like that? The prophet Zechariah says this about the return of the king. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a large valley. Half of the mountain shall move towards the north and half of it toward the south. In verse 10 of our text, we read, For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed. But my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has mercy on you. Massive changes in the heavens and on earth are in store during the future time of tribulation. Those enduring it will think it is the end of humanity. Verse 11, O you afflicted one, tossed with tempest and not comforted. This sounds like the last three and a half years of the tribulation when Israel is being hunted down by the Antichrist. Verse 11 goes on and says, Behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystal, and all your walls of precious stones. Gates and walls and pinnacles are physical components of a city. This isn't the new Jerusalem that is talked about in the New Testament and described in the Revelation because the description doesn't match up at all with these precious stones and all. Jerusalem on earth will be destroyed by the Antichrist and his armies before the Lord returns. This seems to be a rebuilt earthly Jerusalem during the millennial kingdom. And so God is promising the Jews in this verse, yes, you're going to be, your city will be destroyed, but when I return... It's going to be rebuilt and be more beautiful than it ever has before, the earthly Jerusalem. Uh, there'll be a heavenly Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem that comes out of the sky. And you think, oh, no, doesn't that just land in Jerusalem and become Jerusalem? It's too big to be Jerusalem, for one thing. Just mathematically, it can't be. <laughs> it, it's not going to fit. Where, it's not the puzzle piece, you know. It's huge. It's, it's tremendous in its size. I think there's one estimate that if, you know, you think, well, how big can it be? Every Christian can have like some, something like 100,000 acres, you know, if you did mathematical computation. So it's, there's a new Jerusalem, and then there's the earthly Jerusalem, and that's what we're looking at here. Again, exciting if you're a Jew, uh, you know, wondering if your city is going to exist. It says in verse 13, all your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. This is, to me, a snapshot of the future kingdom on earth. Uh, it, it, you know, people ask, what's that going to be like? What's the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign, going to be like? And some people talk about the agriculture or the abundance of this or the fact that people won't die or whatever. And Isaiah says, here, let me show you what it's going to be like. Jesus, who's ruling and reigning from this Jerusalem, is going to show up at your kid's school one day and tell stories. What, isn't that great? 
Well, I mean, if you had a picture of that, you're right. Jesus, here's Jesus telling, you know, Nora a story. That means there's a lot of peace going, right? That, that means the world is at peace. Jesus can leave Jerusalem. He's not warring with anybody. He's ruling with a rod of iron. I think I'll stop by a school here and, and you know, uh, talk to some kids. Hey, kids, what story do you want to hear? You want to hear about Daniel and the lions then? I can get Daniel here. He's a friend of mine. You know, I mean, that kind of thing. And, and so uh, this is, is sweet. Maybe we should call the Millennial Kingdom story time. Verse 14, in righteousness you shall be established, you shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near you. Indeed, they shall uh, surely assemble, but not because of me. Whoever assembles against you shall fall for your sake. Throughout its history, God assembled nations to discipline Israel. He assembled uh, Egypt, he assembled Assyria, he assembled Babylon, he said, whenever they were blowing it and needing discipline, how do you discipline a nation? You use other nations. And so he said, okay, I will assemble this nation, and they will discipline you for a time. 150 years from the time Isaiah was writing, God would assemble Babylon, and they would discipline him. And then after them, Rome. And then after that, in the future, the devil's going to be let out and assemble against the Lord and his people. But he says here, that's not, if somebody assembles against you, it's not me. I'm not disciplined. In fact, he's saying, you will never be disciplined by me again. You won't need to, and I won't do it. Wouldn't it be great to tell your kids, I'm never going to discipline you again? Uh... <laughs> Behold, I have created the... Actually, there's a lot of kids at Save Mart who their parents have done that, but... You belong to that, I know, you, you, I, there's a verse in Isaiah I'd like you to read, you know, but anyway. <laughs> Behold, I have created the blacksmith who blows the coals in the fire, who brings forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the spoiler to destroy. The next destroyer God would arm against his people would be Babylon. They leveled the Jewish temple. Then Rome, who leveled the Jewish temple, and uh, these would be created instruments of God's discipline. The way a blacksmith makes you know, uh, swords and shields. There's always that scene in those medieval movies where the war is going to happen, and so they fire up the blacksmith. He's, oh, oh, you know, he's got these swords. Nice steel, you know, and stuff. And so God says, yeah, I, I, I have done that in the past, but I'm not going to do that anymore. That, you know, I created that discipline, but you're not going to have that anymore. Now, um, there's a whole lot of suffering still ahead in Israel's future. Bear that in mind as we read this last verse. No weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Notice the word heritage. This promise is inherited in the future. I don't in any way want to discourage you, but this verse is only for Israel and even they can't claim it yet. Israel can't say that this is true right now, right? That n nothing can prosper against them. How many Jews were killed at the very beginning of this thing in the sneak attack by Hamas? And what's going on right now? This is not some spiritual verse that promises you you will not be hurt physically or anything like that. This is, this is a real promise that in the future... No weapon will come against her to prosper. And so we can't claim it. It's not for us. They can't claim it yet. I hope it's not your life verse. Because if it is, you need a new one. I'll suggest one in a moment. Apologist Greg Kokel writes, many promises in the Bible were made to other people, and we cannot legitimately claim them. We can learn from them. They're profitable for us. All Scripture is. Sometimes I think we bring despair and discouragement into our own lives by claiming things from the Bible that aren't for us, that don't really directly apply to us. Because there are different times and different groups in the Bible. Now, we have a lot of promises, a lot of promises as the church, and a lot of them have to do with suffering. We are promised suffering. But we are also promised the, the, the Lord's strength 
and endurance and presence in our suffering. And if we would start claiming those, then I think we would be a lot happier and do a lot more rejoicing. Claim, you want to claim a scripture today, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. That's a great verse. That's, that's a great life verse. But notice it talks about weakness. He says, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, reproaches, needs, persecutions, distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That's the kind of promise that'll get you through the church age. You know, a lot of times people come, or I've done it, you've done it, you say, man, I, I'm just, I'm getting reproached at work. I'm just, I'm under a, you know, everybody's reproaching me for, for something. You should come home and say, guess what happened today? My boss reproached me for being a Christian. I almost came out of my shoes. But, you know, it's because from a, I don't, I don't, you know, these are the promises that are for us. These are the promises that are going to help you. Uh, and so get with the program. <laughs> We've got to talk about suffering. We trip over the word sufficient here. I looked up its synonyms, uh, you know, in terms of how we use words. We started with passion and passing and how it's changed over the years. When we think of sufficient, its synonyms in the, in the dictionary are adequate, passable, okay, minimal, and ordinary. Is that what Jesus meant? My grace is passable. My grace is minimal. My grace is okay in a pinch. Can you imagine telling that to somebody? Somebody come in suffering and struggling and they're under a burden and say, let's go to the Lord whose grace is minimal. I mean, where did that come from? But that's, I think, sometimes what we hear when somebody says, my grace is enough or my grace is sufficient. It's like it's just right there. It's not super abundant. It's just right there. And if I could just get another, you know, gram of it, it, it would be great. But no, that's not it at all. Paul says, that's all I need to know is that there's grace for me. So if I'm going to get beat up again, if I'm going to die again and come back to life, how many more shipwrecks? I don't know. I'll be like the, the world's greatest shipwreck, you know, advisor and stuff. Paul was into it. He understood. And you know why? Maybe it was easier for Paul because he used to kill Christians. He used to murder Christians. He hated Christians. And then Jesus Christ himself appeared to him and saved him. And so maybe he thought, hey, I... <laughs> I was the chief of sinners, and I continue that way. I just want to serve the Lord and all. But the idea is that these are the kind of promises that you need. God provides you everything necessary for a godly life. Sufficient is a big word, a strong word, so is enough. Thomas Brooks wrote, and we'll end here, God has in himself all power to defend you, all wisdom to direct you, all mercy to pardon you, all grace to enrich you, all righteousness to clothe you, all goodness to supply you, all happiness to crown you. Father, we want to be crowned with uh, a spiritual happiness, filled with your goodness, knowing that your grace is sufficient in an overabundant way. Many of us are hurting physically, Lord. Some are hurting mentally or emotionally. Finances are a problem. We're uh, anxious, Lord, about the world in which we live. People are talking about World War III as if it's a, a, a real thing. Different sections of the world, Lord, are about to just blow up and food chain, supply chain, all this stuff is hitting us. Lord, I pray that we would believe that your gr grace is enough, that, uh, Lord, if suffering is on our horizon, we, you know, we're thankful we're not going through the tribulation, but if there's some suffering on our horizon, Lord, uh, praise the Lord. It cannot separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And I pray that our testimony and our witness, Lord, would increase. And so, Lord, use us and bless us as being used by you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Norm is up front to pray with you. So is Pat. Um, come on up and, and uh, you know, all of us need prayer all the time. And so just, you know, believer, come on up. If somebody you need to pray for, maybe your family. 
uh, whatever, whatever you've been praying for, pray with these guys. If you're not a Christian, you're here because of God's divine appointment and invitation. He wanted you to be in this atmosphere with, you know, just other Christians who love Jesus and love one another, to feel the, literally feel the Spirit of God and, and to have your heart opened and your will freed so that you could decide that Jesus Christ is your Redeemer. You, you committed sins that you can't atone for. There's nothing you can do about your sin except die in them and for them. And that death is going to be an eternal death of separation in a place called the lake of fire. But you can believe Jesus. The Philippian jailer said, what must I do to be saved? And the Apostle Paul said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what you need to do. So come on down, pray with the guys, uh, and um, experience new life in Jesus Christ. Be set free. Be put back together. The rest of us just uh, pray quietly, silently, or join in with song as we rejoice that the Lord loves us and has provided for us before we go back out into the big bad world in which uh, we are to shine as lights and to uh, preserve as salt. God bless you. Amen.
water you turn into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine